right, biologists, we are now going to get into some of the depth of the meat of the uh, ecology unit. And what we're going to be talking about first, if I can get my little slideshow operational, is uh, energy flow in ecosystems. And you're like, that means nothing. That's boring. All right. Uh, let's see if we can cut down to see what exactly we're talking about. So there are two things that all living things have got to have, okay? First of all, they have to have stuff to build their bodies out of. And what that means is molecules. They've got to have molecules to build their bodies out of. Your flesh and bone, that a, a, a pine tree's flesh and bone, bark and leaf, it's all made out of molecules. All organisms are built of molecules. But they also must have energy in order to build those bodies out of the molecules. A, a, um, a, a Lego tower does not automatically just build itself, poof. Energy has to go into putting one block on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. And that, so, the blocks are great, the molecules are great, but you got to have energy to, to build the bodies, to build those towers, and then to make the, the Lego contraption move, to make this thing move around and grow and develop and all of that. And all living things need both of those items, stuff to build themselves out of and energy. Now, in ecosystems, energy and molecules get moved around. They get passed from one thing to another to another. And that's one of the key interactions. Remember that word interactions. One of the key interactions between organisms is passing molecules and energy from one organism to another uh, and so on. Um, that happens in two different ways. Okay. Energy let me see if I can get rid of this. Uh, energy flows through an ecosystem one way from point A to point B to point C, but it's never going to go back to A again. The original source that would be at point A perhaps is the sun and it that energy is caught by certain living organisms that have the ability to do that and then that energy is passed from one organism to the next. Molecules are a little bit different. They are like the blocks of Legos that are used over and over and over again. They are cycled or if you want to think of it as being recycled. Okay, All the atoms that have ever been on this planet are still on this planet and they there are no new ones except for a few that have come from meteorites and so on over the over the years but the same atoms that are here now were here a billion years ago and they have been used over and over and over again to build one organism that organism dies clunk its body parts its molecules are put back into the earth and used by other organisms and then clunk back into the earth and then built used to build other organisms. So you, parts of you have been in other organisms before. Think about that for a while. Um, so, but if you'll remember the, the focus of this podcast is on energy. So let's focus on energy moving through an ecosystem. What exactly is energy? Energy, if you remember from years ago in your early school science beginnings is simply the ability to do work. Now, that phrase never meant a whole lot to me. It's fine, it's the ability to work, but in the case of living things, what we're really talking about is the energy to do those important life processes, to grow, to reproduce, to make all of our cells do all the little jobs they need to do to keep us living. That's the work we're talking about that's really important in biology. Now, there's two types of energy. There is kinetic energy, that energy of motion. We can also think of that as mechanical energy. It's just energy to move, like that cheetah is really moving there, okay? But there is also potential energy, stored energy, chemical energy. 
there are other ways to store potential energy, okay? But chemical energy is the main way we store energy in biology. And what do I mean by chemical energy? Well, there's some chemical energy, some delicious looking chemical energy right there. Food. Food is potential energy. That's a bunch of energy right there. And if your body knows what to do with that, you can get the energy out of it and use it to move around, okay? Um, so that's what we're talking about with energy. Uh, that's that, that mystical thing that allows you to move around and so on. Now, where does the energy that makes life go and do things, where does it come from? That energy ultimately comes from only two places that we know of, at least on Earth. The sun, okay, and something we know less of, though we know a lot more about it than we did just, you know, 30 years ago or more, um, dissolved chemicals spewing out of hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. So what you hear, see here is called a black smoker. This is at the deep, deep bottom of the ocean floor. And this, these chemicals are just pouring out of the interior of the earth itself um, into the ocean. And there are a whole host of organisms that live because these chemicals uh, can be harnessed as an energy form, just like the, like, like, like the sun can be harnessed as an energy form. It's kind of crazy, but we'll talk about that. These are the two sources of energy for all of life on planet Earth. You either run from the, on the energy of the sun or you run from this type of chemical type energy, okay? So, two processes then allow life forms to harness this energy that we just looked at, the sun, and or this, this kind of chemistry energy here. Two processes. One is, of course, photosynthesis. That is where energy from the sun is used to build food molecules. So if you think again about our Lego tower, if I am building a Lego tower and we're mimicking the, the process of photosynthesis, my hands lifting a block and connecting it and lifting a block and connecting it, that is what the energy of the sun is doing when it's building food molecules, okay? Um, so, chemosynthesis is the other uh, process that harnesses that, that chemical energy source coming out of the earth. They are high, uh, coming out of those uh, vents are sulfur-based chemicals, actually H2 hydrogen sulfide, it looks like that, which kind of looks like another famous compound, H2O, but it's not that, but very similar in the way it's used by these organisms. Sulfur-based chemicals are broken down and their energy is released by breaking them down to build, and that energy is used to build food molecules. So sulfur-based chemicals are broken down and the energy released in that process is used to build food molecules, all right? So just like the energy from the sun up here is being used to construct food molecules, the energy in these chemicals is released from those chemicals and used to build food that organisms can use, okay? Now, who can do those processes? You can't. You can't do photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, okay? Photosynthesis, however, can be done by plants, algae, we'll see some of that later in the year, and some photosynthetic bacteria. Bacteria are the most simple forms of life, and there is a type of bacteria that's very important to life on Earth called cyanobacteria. Those of you who do art may have seen a color called cyan. It just means blue-green, and that's where this type of bacteria uh, gets its name, okay? All of them, all of them, even though they're pretty different um, in other important ways, all of those do photosynthesis. Chemosynthesis, as far as we know, is done by only chemosynthetic bacteria. There are a few different types of chemosynthetic bacteria, but back, these are bacteria that harness this chemical energy coming out of the earth 
and use that energy to build food molecules. And once they build food molecules, then it can be distributed not only to those bacteria, but to other organisms nearby. So regardless of if we were talking about plants, algae, cyanobacteria, chemosynthetic bacteria, all of those organisms are autotrophs. Remember what that means. An autotroph is any organism that captures energy and uses that energy to make its own food, to make its own food. They can be photosynthesizers or chemosynthesizers. It does not matter. They are all autotrophs if they are making their own food. So those plants, there's some chemosynthetic bacteria around this mineral spring. Um, so either way, either way you look at it, um, that captured energy, whether it's the sun's energy or energy being captured from using hydrogen sulfide um, and breaking it down to get the energy out, that energy is used to take simple little inorganic molecules, and we'll talk about what that means, but simple small building blocks, Legos, and it's used to assemble those into big complex molecules, organic compounds that make up this stuff. This is really big and complex, okay? And so the energy from the sun or from the hydrogen sulfide compounds coming out of those deep sea vents gets used to build this stuff, okay? Out of other small chemical building blocks, out of little Legos, if you will, okay? Autotrophs, since they harness the energy of the sun, for example, and allow others to access it through their food molecules, they are called producers, okay? <coughs> they are producing food really for all of us, not just themselves. All right, so energy flow in ecosystems. Um, for the rest of this talk, we are going to focus on the photosynthesizers, just to kind of make it more simplified. Um, their energy source, of course, is going to be the sun. And interestingly, um, of all the solar radiation, all the sun's energy that comes down to Earth, very, very little of it. I mean, like, look at this. This graphic says 0.023% goes to photosynthesis, goes to living things. The rest of it is used just to heat the water vapor and the surface and uh, gets some of it gets reflected back from, from the earth. Less than 1%, that's the number I want you to remember, less than 1% is actually captured and used by living organisms. That's amazingly small amount, but if you consider all the energy coming from the sun, that's still probably a fair amount of energy, uh, but not very much given all of the energy from the sun. Okay, um, now remember, of course, that some of those autotrophs, those chemosynthesizers, don't need sunlight, but that's not what we're talking about here. All right, photosynthetic autotrophs then use energy from light to convert carbon dioxide and water into oxygen and sugar or food or glucose or C6H12O6 or whatever you want to call it. We can use all of those terms interchangeably. You need to know this equation. Light plus carbon dioxide plus water is going to yield or give us, that's what that means, that arrow, oxygen plus sugar. That's the glucose, the food, the C6H12O6. That's the important thing that the plant is trying to make. And if a plant could not make sugar, then we would have nothing because we can't make sugar in our bodies. It is the plants who harness that sun's energy, make food molecules, and then because we can eat plants and eat other organisms that eat plants, we can harness that energy, but if it weren't for the plants and other photosynthesizers, that's it. There, there would be nothing. Um, so there are autotrophs and, of course, heterotrophs. Remember, autotrophs make their own food inside their own bodies, but heterotrophs have to eat that food out, from outside of their bodies. But regardless of how autotrophs or heterotrophs get their food, 
both of them, once they've gotten the food, whether they've made it themselves or whether they've eaten it from an outside source, both of them must break down those food molecules to release energy out of them and to also use those building blocks of the food molecules, those atoms, those molecules of the food to build their own body parts, okay? So both plants and animals have to break down that food to release its energy so they can have energy to move and do stuff, but also to have the building blocks they need, the Legos, to build their own body parts. All right? Now, heterotrophs, we've already said, eat other organisms to get energy and nutrients, but they are also called, and this is important ecologically speaking, they are called consumers. They don't produce much, but they do consume a lot. There are several types of heterotrophs, okay? There are herbivores, okay? That's a fine looking herbivore there. They are considered first level consumers, meaning they are going to feed directly on the producers. So they're the first in line, the plants harness the energy from the sun, convert it to food, and boom, the herbivore is right there to eat the plant and get that food and use it, the energy in that food for their own purposes. There are carnivores, second level consumers that can eat herbivores, for example, or you could have a third level consumer that can eat those carnivores, that, those second level consumers. Or you can even have fourth level consumers that eat those third level carnivores. Um, so there can be quite a lot of levels of different consumers or carnivores in um, an environment, in an ecosystem. There are omnivores that eat both plant and animal material. That's a cute little omnivore. There's some other little omnivores I know. Um, we, of course, are all omnivores. Detritivores, okay? Detritivores and decomposers, which is gonna be the next slide, you kind of think of them together. Uh, detritivores, you kind of think of they're eating kind of yucky stuff in big chunks. Uh, this little dung beetle, he could eat that waste material. This guy, this black vulture, we're going to learn about him later, eats dead organisms. Uh, they're basically the, the cleanup crew for planet Earth. Thank you, vultures and dung beetles, okay? Now, decomposers, um, at least your textbook is looking at this at more of the molecular level. These guys are going to be doing more of the microscopic decomposition. They're going to break down the tissue and the chemicals in once living tissue and return those things back into the environment. Uh, bacteria and fungus are both going to be doing that. So these guys are decomposing this, this uh, wood and, and returning those nutrients actually back into the soil. All right. So... To get energy from one place to another in an ecosystem, feeding relationships between different organisms or different populations of organisms uh, different, uh, is really, really important, okay? Remember, energy flows through an ecosystem in one direction, and in our terrestrial, above ground, uh, out in the open sun ecosystem, that would be going from the sun to the photoautotrophs, those photosynthesizers, to the heterotrophs. That's the one-way flow of the energy. It is never ever going to come back the other way. Once it's gone through, it's done. It can't be recycled. That's something important to remember. It can't be recycled. Energy is, is going to pass through and get to an unusable form that just can't be used anymore by living things. Remember, of course, in certain ecosystems, the energy sources, those inorganic chemicals, that H2S, and the chemoautotrophs, those bacteria, harness that, and then other heterotrophs, these weird worms and other organisms down there in the deep sea can eat those bacteria, and then you've got a whole ecosystem surrounding those inorganic compounds, okay? All right, here's another term that's really important uh, in feeding relationships, and that's food chains. Now, you know from way back uh, when you were a little kid, a food chain is just a series of steps uh, of eating and being eaten. So here's a flower, a producer, 
the little caterpillar is going to eat the leaves of this flower, but then the caterpillar, his energy that he collected from the flower and put in his body is going to go to the frog, but then the frog and his energy is going to go to the snake, and then the snake and his energy is going to get eaten up by the owl, and that's a food chain. <clears throat> and a food chain is pretty simplistic. You're just looking at one chain of, of, um, and, of organisms as the food and energy go from one to the next. Um, if, and this is really the important bit here, if we eliminate the frog, though, that is going to cause imbalance both above and below this food chain. Um, if we eliminate the frogs in a community, in this community, then the cat what's going to happen to the caterpillar population? There's nothing to eat them, so they explode and they have huge numbers, which is going to impact the plants. Um, but the snake will have nothing to eat. So the snake population goes down, which of course affects the owl population. And so it's really important to keep all the links in the chain present. All right, now a food web is a bit of a more realistic depiction. It's not just this one little food chain, but it is a network of all the complex interactions uh, and all those feeding relationships that are linked together in an ecosystem. So usually, thank goodness, it's not just one straight chain because that could easily get disrupted, but a food web links all those food chains in an ecosystem together. So this is a great diagram of a food web. Um, the rabbits in this population, all of these guys are eating off of the plant life but a fox could eat any one of these and a hawk or owl could eat any one of these and so on and so we see that if the cardinal population goes down well that's not good but the fox does have other food sources and so maybe the cardinal population can rebound uh, while the fox is eating other more readily available organisms and so on so a lot of complex interactions but again if you start killing off different members, your food web starts to become more and more like a food chain, and then your whole ecosystem gets very, very unstable uh, and, and in danger of collapsing, okay? All right, an important term, trophic levels, trophic levels. A trophic level is simply the fancy word for a step in a food chain, okay? So you could have the, uh, <clears throat> producers down here, these seagrasses, the herbivores eating them, and the first level consumers, the second level consumers, and so on. Okay? Um, and that's what we were just talking about. And also remember the decomposers. And the decomposers can really operate at all these levels, all these trophic levels, because at any point, if any of these organisms dies or leaves waste, decomposers and detritivores are going to come in and consume that stuff. So uh, they would be present anytime any of these organisms dies or leaves waste. All right, so here's an important question, an ecology question. How much energy is in each trophic level? The amount of energy you have in each trophic level is going to determine how healthy, how varied, how vibrant your ecosystem can be. And one of the ways we can um, diagram this, to show this, to model it, is by using an equal ecological pyramid. And this is just a diagram, that's all it is, that shows the relative amounts of energy or matter that are contained in each trophic level in a food chain or a food web. So, that's a bunch of words. Let's just look at one. There's three types, a pyramid of energy, a pyramid of biomass, and a pyramid of numbers, okay? First is a pyramid of energy, and it just shows the amount of energy available in each trophic level. It is measured in calories, or in this case, kilocalories, thousands of calories. Calories is a unit of energy, okay? That's all it is. So what we see here, okay, is we've got lots of energy, 6,000 kilocalories down here with the primary producers or the plants and all of that. Um, but we've only got 600 kilocalories up here present in all these herbivorous creatures that are feeding off of the plants, and only 60 here, 
and only six at this final level. Please note, less actually, less than 10% of the energy that is available in one trophic level gets passed to the next trophic level as those organisms can consume each other. Why is it so much less? Why isn't all 6,000 kilocalories passed up to these herbivores when these herbivores eat the plants? Well, it's because those plants don't store every drop of energy they get from the sun. They don't just store that and keep it in their little plant bodies forever. They use it. They use it to grow. They use it to make seeds. They use it to make flowers and reproduce. They, they use that energy. And once that energy is used, these the deer and all of that, they can't get to that energy anymore. All they can get to is what's actually in the plant at the moment they eat it. Okay? So, <clears throat> less than 10% of the energy available within one trophic level is actually passed up to the next. Okay? Um, and there's the answer. Organisms use that energy. So, 10%. But only 10% of that, only 10% of that. So it gets small, the amount of energy each level has to work with gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay? Um, now, think about this in terms of what people eat. If you're a vegetarian, okay, if all people were vegetarians, we can feed a lot more people at this level, there's a lot more organisms getting fed at this level than there is at this level, okay? Um, if we didn't eat meat, if people, populations weren't eating meat, we could feed a lot more people off the vegetation uh, than we can off of meat. It takes a lot more energy, a lot more has to go up that trophic level to get to make meat that can be consumed by, say, us. Um, so, just something to think about. That's just another pyramid of energy. Uh, the J stands for joules. It's just another energy unit. Okay? Uh, pyramid of biomass. It shows the same exact thing. It just shows it in terms of amount of biomass or amount of actual living tissue by mass in a particular trophic level. So, it's measured in grams per unit of area, or in this case, kilograms per unit per acre, okay, we have here, and we can see again, there's a lot more grasses than there are grasshoppers, than there are mice, and only one kilograms worth of hawks in this particular environment, okay? And what this really does a good job of reflecting is how much potential energy is in each trophic level. A lot more potential energy is available among the grasses than there is among the hawks in, in, in this environment, okay? Finally, there's a pyramid of numbers you can look at. And this is literally like you go out and you count every blade of grass, or you count, um, and I need to move this picture, just a second. Let me move this so we can see here, okay? Um, basically, you count 10,000 grass plants. Those 10,000 grass plants can support 10 mice but those 10 mice can support only one hawk, okay? Now, be aware that, you know, that looks very much like the pyramids we've seen up to now, but this pyramid is different. It's inverted. Why? It's upside down. Because there are some little ecosystems that are based on just one plant, like a tree, and all the birds that live in that tree, and all the bugs that live off of those birds, and then all the bacteria that are host hosted by those bugs and so on so in this case you could actually have an upside down pyramid if you're talking about it, one great big tree hosting lots of little little critters so just be aware of that possibility should you see it usually they aren't tricky like that but you never know all right that's it for this podcast i know that was a long one um hopefully i'll be able to break them down into more discrete units next time thanks for watching i will see you in class take care